tending to our mitochondria. So much of what we've talked about in this mitochondrial series is about how our mitochondria function, how they are sensitive to the light in our environment, how they are sensitive to the sounds in our environment, how they are sensitive to the input of our emotion and frequency of our thoughts, how they're sensitive to that flow of electrons and protons throughout the mitochondrial membrane, creating that electrical charge that is so necessary, not only to mitochondrial function, but to maintaining that overall electrical charge of a cell of a tissue, of our organs, of our body overall. It's foundational in our health. We know that from Wallace's work, maintaining that mitochondrial voltage is vital to not only, again, that mitochondrial function, but our overall health. As soon as that starts to dip, we see a rise in symptoms and disease onset. And so how do we tend to our mitochondrial health? It comes back to the inputs that our mitochondria are sensitive to. We can tend to our thoughts and emotions. We can tend to those ideas of creating a state of coherence. And coherence doesn't necessarily mean that we are always in a state of love and light and gratitude, although the research clearly shows that those emotions are beneficial for our mitochondrial function. Coherence is the idea that we are resonating, we are one, we are on the same page, we are playing the same tune as the emotion that we are feeling. So even those deemed more negative emotions of anger, frustration, grief, those emotions, if they are felt in coherence where we are actually fully accepting of those and walking with those feelings and welcoming them so we can feel them and then release them, those don't have the same impact as a negative feeling such as anger that we might be splintering and judging and pushing onto someone else. So tending to our coherence and our emotional state is one way to tend to our mitochondrial function. Tending to the light in our environment is another way to tend to our mitochondrial function. We know that our mitochondria are fine-tuned to receive light in the near-infrared and red spectrum. And that is abundant in that early morning sun, sunrise, sunset, the spectrum of light, that natural spectrum of light that the sun provides when it's rising and setting is full of that red spectrum at that time. And we can just see that when we go outside at sunset, at sunrise, that beautiful orange and red hue that happens when the sun sets, that provides the stimulus for our mitochondria to produce ATP more efficiently, to produce that charge more efficiently, to uh, make those electrons travel down the electron transport chain more efficiently. And infrared light, near infrared light, is another one that we see clearly benefiting our mitochondria, clearly benefiting that, uh, again, flow of electrons through the electron transport chain and the generation of ATP more efficiently. And when we're talking about these different inputs of light, it's important that we also talk about that structured water, that it's lining not only the outside of our mitochondria and the inside of our mitochondria, but it's lining the proteins of the electron transport chain. These proteins lined on the outside with structured water, lined on the pores that are going through those proteins that are allowing the protons to go through those proteins to create ATP. Those are lined with structured water on the outside and through that pore. And those allow for the capturing and the um, transfer of 
electrons, excitons, photons, protons within the proteins of the electron transport chain. So not only is a thing that we're reading in um, the research recently about near infrared light and red light impacting the efficiency of making ATP, that energy currency in our mitochondria, but also that structured water and how it interacts with infrared energy and how infrared energy, according to Gerald Pollack and his idea about the fourth phase of water, allows us to jump conduct those proteins, capture those photons of light and those electrons, and get them down the gradient to create ATP more efficiently and maintain that electrical charge and voltage in the mitochondria. So we have tending to our thoughts and emotional state. We have tending to the light in our environment. And that also means looking at the light that is artificial in our environment, looking at the light that's man-made, right? So right now I'm sitting inside and I have a full um, panel of open glass doors that are letting in natural light, plus a window behind me, um, or actually in front of me, letting in that natural light. But I also have a bright ring light and some artificial light that is inundating my system with a very small, narrow band of blue light, right? So if I were to take a spectrometer and look at the different range of light that's happening inside right now versus outside. And I'm here in the Pacific Northwest, so it is not a beautiful sunny day outside. It is that gray that we live under for months here in the winter. But still, that spectrum of light that I'm going to get outside is going to be much greater than the spectrum of light that I'm getting inside from these artificial lights. Because not only does the sun hold a much broader um, spectrum of light, but these artificial lights don't have even a full band of blue light that they're emitting, right? The band of blue light that they're emitting is very narrow. It's very precise and very chaotic for our body to make sense of. Our body is used to and has evolved with over millennia that broad spectrum of natural light that comes from the sunlight. And so when we're talking about light, we have to remember that the light we see, the visible light of the rainbow, right? The, the violet, the blue, green, yellow, orange, red spectrum that we see is only a very small sliver of that electromagnetic spectrum of light. And it goes from uh, microwaves and gamma rays into the UV range, which we talk a lot about with sun exposure. And then we see that visible light being a very small sliver of the spectrum. And then it goes right into that infrared spectrum where we're talking about near infrared, mid infrared, uh, far infrared, according to the wavelength, right? And we're going from 300 to, you know, 650, 680 nanometers in the visible spectrum to a much wider range in the uh, infrared spectrum. And so what we're talking about is the wavelength of light and our ability for our body to absorb that light and use it for biological processes. So when we're talking about artificial light inside and the blue light that is detrimental to our health, it's not because it's blue. It's because it's such a narrow spectrum and such a small sliver of the visible spectrum that we're just inundating our body with. It's telling our body that it's the middle of the day. It's spacing those proteins in the electron transport chain further apart. So tending to our mitochondrial health also looks like tending to our light environment and being really aware of what kind of artificial light we are being influenced by that's in our environment and how we're um, balancing that with natural light. So I just use the example here of how I have these artificial lights on inside, but I also have a 
sliding glass door right here, letting in natural light. I have a light um, in front of me coming in through the window. And I balance my light exposure by going outside, by getting exposure to that natural light. Safe exposure to sunlight is one of the most beneficial things we can do for our mitochondria. Of course, we don't want to burn and we want to take care to um, not get damaged from the sun. And that's a whole nother video unto itself. But what we're talking about is balancing that natural light with the artificial light in our environment. And that can look like lowering the lights at night, making sure that that artificial light isn't predominant after the sun goes down. I use a lot of these salt lamps around the house. We use um, some incandescent lights in the kitchen in case we need to do something in there. Uh, but salt lamps and no blue light uh, reading lamps are what my family uses during the winter months when the sun goes down here in the Pacific Northwest around 4, 5 p.m., right? So we're using lighting like that to not block the conversion of serotonin into melatonin and that release of melatonin from the pineal gland. We're also using it to make sure that we're tending to that spacing of those proteins in the mitochondrial trans electron transport chain. We're also using uh, blue light blocking glasses and I'll leave a link for those in the description and that's something that we use when having exposure to artificial lights is inevitable. And so that's part of modern life too, as well. So uh, we're doing all those things to tend to our mitochondrial health as far as our light environment goes. Now, we talked about our thoughts. We talked about light. Sound is another one, making sure that we are getting that full spectrum of sound, making sure that we have sounds in our environment that we find pleasing, right? Our favorite sounds. And I went over this in an earlier video about mitochondria and sound and frequency, and you can watch in more depth there, but making sure that we have access to that in our life, that music is a part of our life, that singing is a part of our life, that laughter is a part of our life. And that brings us to another thing that's intimately connected with uh, sound and music, dance, movement, making sure that we are moving and charging that flow of energy through our mitochondria, making more mitochondria per cell, making that uh, ATP and electron transport chain more efficient. Exercise is a wonderful way to do that and it doesn't have to be high intensity training or Olympic workouts. It can be a walk outside. That's a beautiful way to tend to our mitochondria. It can be dancing to our favorite song. These are wonderful ways to tend to that mitochondrial voltage and mitochondrial health. Now, we talked about that infrared exposure that's coming from the sun, but we didn't talk about how it's also coming from movement. And when we move our body, we're creating infrared energy that can help structure that water, that cell bound structured water on the outside of our mitochondria, on the inside and lining the proteins in the electron transport chain. Infrared energy from sauna is another way to do that, right? But movement is a wonderful way to help tend to our mitochondrial health and function and voltage. And, you know, this is something that's not really talked about a lot in mainstream medicine, but tending to our voltage and our mitochondrial voltage is so vital for our overall health. So these are just some simple ways to uh, think about how we can tend to our mitochondrial health, how we can tend to our voltage. This is something that I dive in depth in my classes and some of my blogs on my website. So make sure you check those out. And if you like this content, make sure you subscribe, like, leave me a comment down below so I know what you'd like to hear more of.
Thank you so much for joining me.